Good evening, ladies, as well as gentlemen. Papa Boris here, playing some more chess. In my last video, I did a game with the Danish Gambit, and when my friend and subscriber recommended that I check out the Danish Gambit, he sent me a link to a chessgames.com page of Danish Gambit games, and I was pleasantly surprised to note that one of them was an Aljochen game. As you know, Aljochen was my favorite chess player when I was a little boy. He uh, was the fourth world champion, and he had a thing for blind simultaneous exhibitions. This game comes from 1924, when the Lurken played against 26 people blindfolded at the same time. And just so we're clear, he was the one blindfolded playing 26 games at once. This was board 26, according to, according to chessgames.com, versus a gentleman named Abraham Freeman, whom I know nothing about. And let's go ahead and begin. So Lurken played e4, and after e5, Lurken decided to spring for the... Uh, Danish Gambit after the pawn took, he played c3. Now this opponent was more cautious and decided not to take Aljochen up on the Gambit and he played d5. According to Aljochen's own analysis, d5 is the best defense versus the Danish Gambit, although nowadays engines do not agree with him. Engines think that black is better off just taking the extra pawn. Just keep in mind that all the engine needs is one good move to say that a position has a certain strength, and it might be the case that if you don't find that move, you're screwed. It's like you're walking a tightrope over a cliff versus walking on a 10-foot wide plank in some cases, so uh, there might be some merit to Lohan's claim that d5 is good. Now after e takes d5, queen takes d5, and c takes d4, there's no denying that this is certainly more comfortable for black than the alternative, uh, because now neither side has really developed anything except for black with the queen out in the middle. Um, white does have a pawn in the center, but it's isolated, so it might be a weakness. Black also has this uh, nice move, bishop to b4 to look forward to, which will check the white king and often pin the white knight on c3, causing some discomfort. So both sides have a little bit going for them. It's a very comfortable position, no matter which side you're on. The engine calls it dead equal. After knight to f6 and knight to c3, uh, we do get this bishop to b4 move, but Alokhan doesn't really care about it. He just ignores it. He plays knight to f3, and now knight to c6. Both sides have developed their knights to the most logical, comfortable squares. Now Alokhan plays bishop to e2, and both sides castle. Now, I gotta give credit to Abraham Freeman, whoever he was. He managed to play eight moves against Alexander Lurkin without making any mistakes. So, good on him, brother. Good, good on him. Or I guess I should say, good on you, brother. Good on you, wherever you're watching this from. Nice job. Most people probably couldn't do that. But here, the train gets off the tracks a little bit. Abraham decided to play bishop take c3. Now, as I've talked about before, in chess, it's a good rule of thumb that when there is tension... You shouldn't release it unless you have a good reason, and Black certainly has no reason whatsoever to voluntarily take this knight on c3. For one thing, it gives up the bishop pair, and bishops are generally a little bit better than knights. And for another thing, this actually does some of White's work for him. Earlier, White had this problem of the isolated d-pawn, which is a weakness, but after this exchange, his little brother has come in for support, and now White center is much better. So uh, Abraham just gave Alexander Alokhin a gift, and Alokhin had to pay nothing for it. Now we have b6, another... I mean, it's not like a mistake or like a bad move, but strategically this move's a bit weak. Maybe Abraham was thinking that after his bishop got to b7, it and the queen could, like, coordinate to do checkmate or something on the diagonal, but that's a pipe dream that's never going to happen. The queen's going to get kicked off of that diagonal long before that ever comes to fruition. And frankly, at the moment, you know, the bishop can already develop to a bunch of different squares. Take your pick in a single move. Spending two moves developing it and not really getting anything out of it while making some weaknesses on these light squares isn't really worth it. Again, not a terrible move, but it's just not the best move. Now, um, Alokhin kicks the queen out of the center with uh, his newly acquired c-pawn, and Abraham decides to go all the way back to d8. There's no reason to undevelop your queen here and uh, disconnect your rooks. Queen d6 would have been totally 100% fine. So it's a little bit too timid to go all the way back to d8. So these last three moves, the capture of the knight on c3, the pushing of the pawn, the movement back of the queen, none of them are bad, but this is often how it goes against a really world-class chess player. Suddenly you're losing and you have no idea what it was that you did that made you in such a bad position because it wasn't anything terrible. It wasn't like an explosion. It was just death by a thousand second best moves. Alokhan loved to push pawns in his career, so he played d5 to kick that knight and get a nice strong central pawn, maybe with dreams of promoting one day. And uh, here, 
Uh, the knight put, got pushed all the way back to e7. Knight a5 was an option, but the knight on the edge isn't really that much better than it is here. So all of a sudden, white's position looks really, really good. And if you're playing this as black, you might be thinking, like, well, where did I go wrong? And it wasn't really in any one thing. It was just a bunch of little things. So now Elohim definitely has a very comfortable position. He develops uh, his knight to the center. Uh, that was another feature, by the way, of pushing the d-pawn was to vacate this nice square for the knight where it's very hard to kick. And after bishop to b7 and bishop to b2, Elohim develops his own bishop on a long diagonal. Um, Abraham decided it was time for this d-pawn to go. And so he begins a rather ill-conceived campaign to get rid of it. He plays c6, which is not a bad move. And here Elohim plays bishop to f3. This is a rather deep move. Engines don't like it, but the longer that you let the engine think about it, the more that it comes to realize like, hey, this is about as good as the move that I was recommending beforehand. So now Abraham takes the pawn on d5, and his quest is so close and yet so far. He really wants to capture on c4, and then open up this light square diagonal for his bishop. But the problem is that right now that that's not possible because this bishop on b7 is unprotected, so uh, the d pawn can't actually capture on c4 unless you want to lose your piece. So look, it just ignores this tension between these two pawns, staring daggers at each other, and plays rook e1, a logical move, putting his rook on the open e-file. Abraham challenges the open e-file with his own rook on e8, which makes sense, and now Elohim plays queen to d2. The idea here is very straightforward. Elohim actually wants to come in to g5 and start an attack. Now, queen d2, according to the engine, is a little bit of a misstep, and according to the engine, black actually gets the advantage back in this position. However, that requires finding exactly one move on the chessboard. Any other move and white has the advantage. The move that black needed to find here was a rather bold one, which uh, Freeman, as we can see in this game, is not a big fan of playing bold moves. Uh, they would have been knight to e4. So you, the idea behind this move is that obviously you're attacking the queen, but on top of that, it's also guarding the g5 square, preventing the white queen from coming in. So wherever the white queen goes, it wasn't where it wanted to go, and really no place is as good for the white queen as g5. We're going to see that as a running theme in this game, that uh, black really did not want the white queen on g5. But uh, Abraham missed this move, and instead he played rook to b8, a very, very passive move, but it's one of those moves that's kind of straightforward. Uh, he really wants to take on c4, and he can't as long as white's bishop is able to take the black bishop on b7. So this bishop to f3 move by Elohim ends up being worth its weight in gold. He nailed his opponent psychologically. And now we've got this wacky situation where four of black's pieces are all piling on this pawn on d5, and then they're all being held uh, at bay by this single lonely pawn on c4, like a David versus Goliath on the chessboard. Anyway, Elohim doesn't really give a shit about this rook on b8. He plays queen to g5. And this position, according to the engine, is equal. But again, it's one of those equalities that is only true if you can find, like, you know, the one good move. Otherwise, white is doing very well here. And this is pretty serious. Believe it or not, if black just casually now takes on c4, he loses on the spot. It's like a game over. Like, that's how serious this is. Because white has this tactic that I'm sure Rukin saw, which was knight to e6. Now, this move is a couple of things. One is it threatens checkmate on g7 with the knight and the queen. And if you block this checkmate, then you lose your queen. So that's that's definitely not good. So the other option, of course, is you can take the knight, but then the other purpose of this move is revealed. When the knight moved away from d4, it actually opened the dark bishop of white on this diagonal, and now the bishop can actually come and take the knight here. Again, we're threatening checkmate on g7, and there's only one way to stop it, which is to, wait for it, give up the queen. So shockingly, black is like a couple moves away from losing his queen in this position. He cannot ignore this threat. Now, I don't know if Abraham Freeman saw it or if he just got lucky, uh, but he did block the threat with the second best move, knight to g6. What he really needed to do here was play h6. This would have been the best thing because you got to get this queen off of g5. On g5, it's attacking g7, and it's also attacking f6, which is significant in some circumstances. So you gotta get it off of that square. And in fact, if you um, push the white queen back, then you can take on c4. And there's a very long variation here, which I will show. The knight to e6 uh, tactic is still there, 
but after the pawn takes and the bishop takes, there's a difference because white's queen's not on g5. Black can now play knight to f5. And so from f5, the knight is not only protecting checkmate on g7, but also attacking the white queen on g3. After white exchanges queens, though, there is a little bit of an interesting tactic. White can play bishop to c7, forking the rook and this knight on g3, so that if the rook moves, the bishop takes the knight and white is up a whole piece. So here what black actually has to do is take on f3, and after white takes on f3, you move the knight and you let white take your rook. At this point, uh, white would obviously take on e6, and now white has four pawns to black's five, and white is up the exchange, a rook for a knight, but black has this fairly deep passed pawn, and while it's not double connected past pawns because the b6 pawn is not passed since it's running past the a pawn, uh, it is able to support the pawn on c4. The engine calls this position equal, just almost dead equal. So this would have been very playable for black to hang on and maybe fight for a draw. So that anyway is just, go, just goes to show the difference between the queen being on g5 and the queen being on g3. But Abraham Freeman did not kick white's queen. He played knight to g6, and this just allows white a move because h6 is forcing white would have to move the queen but here white can do whatever he wants and he plays knight to f god i hate the one thing about this chess thing is that uh when you press the up or down button it takes you to the end of the game for some reason so when you you know when you press the right button it's the next move and when you press the down button it shows the end of the game so pardon me uh white played knight to f5 f5 of course is a classic square for a white knight in an attacking game and it also unleashes this bishop on this diagonal here, I'm not going to keep showing you variations, but I'll just keep saying it. Uh, Ibrahim Freeman's best move was to play h6 and chase white's queen. But he, for some reason, just didn't want to do this, and he played rook takes e1. Now, there are other moves besides h6 that he could have played that were better than rook takes e1. Rook takes e1 is particularly bad, because what this does is it basically does white's job for white. Right now, both sides have a rook fighting for the e-file. After the exchange... White controls the e-file. So, you know, you come up to Alexander Lohin, the future world chess champion, one of the greatest players who has ever lived and the dominant player of his day, and say, hey, why don't you get the open e-file? You know, I don't want it. I thought maybe you could use it. It's just handing White a gift. And now, Abraham Freeman should have really done something about this whole attack situation brewing over here. Maybe h6 would have been okay. Maybe knight to e4 to try to block the rook would have been okay. White's definitely got an advantage here, but definitely don't don't take on c4. So he finally gets to take on c4, but uh, unfortunately Freeman did not quite set it up well enough. He's been trying to do this for like five moves now, but when he finally does it, it's still too soon. Alohin here actually missed the best continuation, which I think we can pardon him for, given that, remember, he was playing 25 other games at the same time as this one, and he was not allowed to look at any of them. He was blindfolded. Uh, the correct continuation here, if you're curious, is knight to e7 check. Now, the idea is the king cannot move. If you go to f8, then the bishop takes on f6, and white's just up a piece, really. That's really all there is to it. White, white has three pieces on the board, black has two. And if you take this bishop, then after queen to h6, you're getting mated. The engine says it's a forced mate in nine. After king to e8, you can withdraw the knight. The king goes to d7, and now we have this nice little chase. But uh, I'm not going to show you everything, because basically after the king moves, white wins black's queen. Um, if you try going in the other direction, if you try going to h8, that's even worse, because now after bishop takes f6, g takes, queen takes f6 is checkmate. So at the end of the day, after bishop takes f6, whether the king moved to f8 or h8, um, the bishop's not capturable, and white, whoops, and white is up a piece. If you take the knight on e7, then white still takes on f6. And now there's this threat of checkmate on g7. There is no running from this with king to f8. If you do that, then after queen takes g7 and king to e8, you can actually play as white, bishop to g4, cutting off black's escape on d7, and then mate's coming in a couple of moves. Basically, the white queen is just going to go back to the back rank and checkmate the black king, and that's, that's the end of it. So, uh, if you don't do that, if you block checkmate like this, then of course you lose your queen. So, 
If Alyokhin had found knight to e7, he could have won a piece and Freeman probably would have resigned. Uh, instead, Alyokhin played bishop takes b7. White is still better here, just not like immediately winning. And this gave Freeman one more chance to play h6 and try to chase away the white queen and hang on. Although white still would have been better, uh, it would have been black's best fighting hope. Instead, he played rook takes b7, just routinely recapturing the bishop. And because black makes that mistake, like if you were to assume that were you to take the bishop, the black would routinely recapture it, that does make taking the bishop the best move because now white is absolutely dominating after bishop takes f6. So black's in a heap of trouble here. Uh, he's just lost a piece and he cannot recapture this bishop. So he's gonna go down a piece and white has an overwhelming attack to boot. If the pawn takes the bishop, then white actually plays queen to h6, quite simply threatening checkmate on g7, and the black king can't even run to f8 because the white queen's got that covered. So you can block this with queen to f8, but then white would have the tactic rook to e8, deflecting the queen. And it doesn't matter if you ignore the rook because the queen is pinned, so then white's gonna come in with checkmate. If you take the bishop with the queen, then you also lose. And I'm not gonna explain why, because that's what Abraham Freeman actually did. You're not allowed to take on f6, but he didn't lost. So black would have had to continue from here just playing a piece down if he didn't wanna lose right away. But in any case, uh, I'm glad that Abraham Freeman did take on f6 because this game, this gave the game a very nice finish. And I wanna note that everything that follows from here has to be calculated. You can't play one move and just like hope for the best because after a rook to e8 check, if you don't know what's coming after knight to f8, then this game is going to be a draw. If you're here and you're like, oh, I don't know what to do, and you like exchange queens or something, this position is just dead equal. There's no winning this knight after knight to h6 check that can go to g7, and uh, the engine's actually saying that white should just do a perpetual, which makes sense because the material is totally equal, except that black has six pawns to white's four, and one of black's pawns is fairly deeply passed. So this would have been just a dead draw. So from here, if you don't find how to win with white, you are drawing this game. Note, by the way, that it, there's a little bit of pressure here because white queen to a1 on black's end is threatening checkmate on the back row so you really have to know what to do and that's why you can't just play rook to e8 willy-nilly so back here alohin saw that after rook to e8 and knight to f8 there's this clever tactic knight to h6 check so here if the king moves then of course the rook captures on f8 and that is a back rank mate. So you have to take with the queen, which Abraham Freeman did. And again, this all had to be calculated from back here in this position. After the queen takes the knight, you have to take the knight on f8 with check. The only move here is to play king takes f8 and now Elohim finishes with queen to d8, a very pretty checkmate. Hope you enjoyed it. Please like and or subscribe if you did. And I hope to see you again soon with some more chess. Take care, everybody.